Our opening prayer this morning comes from John Philip Newell, uh, who wrote a Celtic-inspired Psalter, and we're actually going to do the Spanish translation of that Psalter, so please join me in our opening prayer. Contigo está la fuente de la vida, oh Dios. Tú eres el comienzo de todo lo, lo que es. De tu vida fluye el fuego del sol naciente. Tú eres el flujo vital de los ríos de la creación. La savia de la sangre en nuestras venas. La fecundidad de la tierra. La fructificación de los árboles. El nacimiento de las criaturas. La concepción de pensamiento nuevo, el origen del deseo. Todos esto te pertenecen, oh Dios, y yo te pertenezco. Tú eres el frescor de la mañana. En el nombre de Padre, de Hijo y el Espíritu Santo. Amén. <música> Good morning, everybody. Today we'll be reading How to Pray from page 222 of our Jesus Storybook Bible. In those days, there were some extra super holy people, at least that's what they thought, and they were called Pharisees. Every day they would stand out in the middle of the street and pray out loud in big extra holy voices. They really weren't praying so much as just showing off. They used lots of special words that were so clever, no one understood what they meant. People walking by would stop and stare, which might sound rude, except that's exactly what the extra holy people wanted. They wanted people to say, they're so holy, look at them. God must love those people best. Now you and I both know that they were wrong. God doesn't just love holy people, but the people walking by weren't so sure. Perhaps you did have to be really clever, or good, or important for God to love you. Perhaps you had to know lots of difficult, clever words to speak to God. So one day, Jesus taught people how to pray. He said, when you pray, you don't have to pray like those extra holy people. They think if they say lots of words, God will hear them. But it's not because you're so clever, or good, or important that God will listen to you. God listens to you because he loves you. Did you know that God is always listening to you? Did you know that God can hear the quietest whisper deep inside your heart, even before you've started to say it? Because God knows exactly what you need even before you ask him, Jesus told them. You see, God just can't wait to give you all that you need. So you don't need to use long words or special words, and you don't have to use a special voice. You just have to talk. So when you pray, pray in your normal voice, just like when you're talking to someone you love very much, like this. Dear God, we want to know you and be close to you. Please show us how. Make everything in the world right again and in our hearts too. Do what is best, just like you do in heaven. And please do it down here too. Please give us everything we need today. Forgive us for doing wrong, for hurting you. Forgive us just as we forgive other people when they hurt us. Rescue us, we need you. We don't want to keep running away and hiding from you. Keep us safe from our enemies. You're strong, God. You can do whatever you want. You are in charge, now and forever and for always. We think you're great, amen. You see, Jesus was showing people that God will always love them with a never stopping, never giving up, 
unbreaking, always and forever love. So they didn't need to hide anymore or be afraid or ashamed. They could stop running away from God and they could run to him instead. As a little child runs into her daddy's arms. Matthew 6, 5 through 15, concerning prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So if we can, let's take a second and, and look again with fresh eyes at this passage. So first of all, Jesus starts off this part uh, when he says, he tells us really about prayer, and he says in the beginning, he starts off by telling us in the preamble, if you will, how not to pray. He says, when you pray, don't pray like this. Don't stand up in front of people, oh Lord. I, I'm from a Southern Baptist tradition, by the way, and if you don't throw some D's and thou's in there and make some King James into it, it's not really an official prayer. But, you know, a lot of times that's what we do. We'll stand up in front of people and we kind of get into this mode and we're kind of praying. And what we're doing is what? We're kind of calling attention to ourselves. And look at me, I'm holy, oh God. But do we pray this way in private? And Jesus' whole point is he says, listen, when you pray, don't be like that. Don't be like those who pray open in the synagogues or out on the street corners. For what reason, he says? To be seen by men. He says, if you're praying that way, to call attention to yourself, you're doing it wrong. Don't do that. And instead he says, I tell you the truth, people that do that, they receive their reward in full. He says, no, but when you pray, when you pray, do this. Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In other words, your Father sees you. He knows you. His eyes are on you. You don't have to do anything to call attention to yourself. He's already sitting there looking at you, listening to you. He's attentive to you. So you don't have to worry about that. Go ahead in, in a private place and shut the door just between you and God and make your request known to him. And then the second thing he tells us not to do, he says, um, don't pray like the pagans do, right? When you pray, he says, don't keep on babbling like the pagans. Why? Because they think that they will be heard if they just keep repeating something they've memorized. Isn't that interesting? For many of us, the Our Father prayer that we're talking about has become something that we just memorize. That we just blah, 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 blah. We're doing it. <laughs> if we're not careful, we can do this. Jesus is warning us, don't do that. But again, notice what he says. Why do the pagans do that? He says, because they think that by doing that, they will be heard. And what Jesus is wanting us to understand is, listen, your Father hears you. He sees you, and He hears you. And you don't have to go through these motions or do these things to get His attention. He's watching you, and He's listening. And so you don't have to go through those motions. And now after getting that out of the way, now He finally tells us this prayer that we're very, very familiar with, and I want to hopefully point out a few things about it before we Come at it again, I think, from a different angle. The first part is this. He says, this then is how you should pray. And in general, it's an instruction, not in a specific, like when you pray, only repeat these exact words. No, 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 that's not what he means. He's saying, when you pray, your prayers, your normal, natural conversations that you're having in private, in that closed room between you and your Father who sees you and hears you, 
it should go something like this. So one other, in general, follow this pattern of the way you, dis, you, you converse with God, with your Father in heaven. And it's like this. We begin by addressing our Father. We say, our Father, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. And we're just understanding the relationship, right? Remember who God is and remember who you are. But he's not just a God far away. He's a Father. He's someone who cares for us. He sees us. He hears us. He loves us. And so we begin the prayer reminding ourselves of this, that we have a Father who cares for us. And then the next part is, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a key part of Jesus' entire Sermon on the Mount. He comes to this over and over again. In fact, at the way Jesus declares the gospel, the good news is this, repent, metanoia, stop, think different, change the way you think. The kingdom of God is here now, today. It's within you. It's close enough that you can go and touch it. It's, you can experience it right now. So when Jesus reminds us here to pray in a way that we say, God, we want your kingdom to come here right now today where we live. Let your kingdom come here and now and let your will be done here and now in my life and in the world around me the same way as it's done in heaven. That's, by the way, a prayer. We're giving God permission to mess with us. If you don't realize that, that's what you're doing. You're saying, okay, God, have at it. What do you want to do? Bring it on, okay? And then he says this, give, give us today our daily bread. I don't know about you, but I have gone through several long seasons of my life where I was out of work. The first time was for a year and a half, and the second time was for a year. And during that time, I was doing temporary work, or, or my family, we were depending on the graciousness and the goodness and the kindness of uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ and family members who would randomly, it seemed, just show up on the doors. I can remember the time, one, one particular day, when my wife, Wendy, our little boys, Dylan and David, they were very young, not even in school yet, and um, she cracked the last egg to scramble an egg. She poured the last of the milk into a bowl of cereal. She pulled the last paper towel off the roll to clean a spill, and we were done. There was nothing else in the house. There was nothing in the pantry. The refrigerator was empty. We were done. And Wendy didn't know what to do, but she was like, well, okay, God, we're trusting you for daily bread, and I'm not making this up. Within uh, 20 minutes, there was a knock on the door, and it was a, well, one of our friends, and she was standing there at the door with a basket, a little gift basket, and she goes, you know, I was just thinking about you guys. I was doing my shopping. I just thought I'd grab a few things for you guys, if that's okay. Can I tell you what was in that basket, everybody? You can probably guess. You know what was in that basket? Eggs, milk, and paper towels. And for a year and a half, that is the way my family survived on daily bread. So let me tell you, God has taught me this lesson of depending on Him for daily bread, knowing that He sees me, He knows me, He knows my family, He knows what we're going through, and He cares, and He's there, and He rescues us, and He moves the hearts of other believers to also come alongside us and help us and lift us up. But I got to tell you, living that way for a year and a half, I didn't want daily bread, to be honest. I was ready for weekly bread, maybe monthly bread. I would have been really happy with annual bread. In other words, God, give me more than enough I need. I'll just manage it. Thanks a lot. But when I do that, it's sort of like what I'm saying is, God, I don't need you. You know, just give me the stuff and, you know, I'll talk to you later. No, no, no. What God was doing was drawing so near to me and my family and saying, I love you, I'm going to care for you, I'm going to provide your daily needs. And I, Actually, what he said to me was, you know, Keith, I'm providing daily for you all the time, even when you have a great job, even when you have money in the bank. You know, I'm still providing your daily needs. This is just a very good way for you to see it and to recognize it, that I am providing for you daily bread. But this is what Jesus is asking us to pray, to ask for our daily bread bread, to depend on God, to rely on God for what we need on a daily basis. Uh, and then he asks us to pray, forgive us our debts in the same way that we have forgiven those or who have debts against us, those who have trespassed against us. Now, this is the, probably the part that's the most difficult for us, right? How Jesus ties our forgiveness from the Father with the way that we forgive others. But Jesus does this quite often, right? He says, in the same way that I have loved you, I want you to love 
one another. And so what I think what Jesus is saying in this part of the prayer is reminding us, doesn't it feel good to be forgiven? When you screw up, when you really, really mess up, you've hurt someone that you love and you care about, you know how much you've hurt them, you see the pain, you, you feel the weight of that horrible thing you've done. Doesn't it feel beautiful to be forgiven? Isn't that like, ah, oh, oh God, thank you. Thank you for that forgiveness. Thank you for that mercy and grace. Yes, it does feel good, doesn't it? It feels so good, you should share it. You should be willing to pass out a little bit of it. Spread it around a little bit. There's a verse in the Old Testament I love, Micah 6, 8. And even though it's an Old Testament verse, it's got this really interesting, it's almost a Jesus-y kind of a verse. It says, uh, He has shown you, O man, God has shown you, O man, what is good and what God requires of you. It's just three things. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And of those three things, I'm convinced the most difficult thing is the second one, to love mercy because of this exact thing. See, when I screw up, when I mess up, when I know what I deserve is a very harsh punishment and rejection and pain because I screwed up, mercy comes and says, it's okay. In fact, instead of giving you this thing you deserve, I'm going to give you a blessing. Whoa, that's incredible. When I receive mercy, think about a time in your life when you have received not what you deserved, but something that was just over-the-top amazing. Wow, this is incredible. Mercy is so good when I'm receiving it. But when I'm standing across the room and I see some other guy who did something wrong and he screwed up and instead of getting what he deserves, he gets blessed? That is not very easy to love. But that's what God is saying. I want you to love mercy so much that you, you remember, you recognize how beautiful mercy is when I'm pouring it out in your life and in your heart. But I want you to love it so much that you want that for your neighbor. You want that for the person across the street. You want that for everybody else. I think it's the, in the same spirit that Jesus says, he wants us to pray, Father, forgive me in the same way I have forgiven others. He wants us to get that, to connect those dots right? Jesus says, uh, you know, actually, sorry, it says in 1 John, how can we say we love God if we don't love our, our brother? In fact, he says, if you say that you love your brother, but you, if you, I'm sorry, if you say that you love God, but you hate your brother, you're a liar. So, the vertical of my love with God is connected. Jesus says, you write the two greatest commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So, my loving God, vertical, it's connected. He says the second greatest commandment is like that first one. It's love your neighbor as yourself. That's the horizontal. We need the horizontal, the horizontal and the vertical to line up. And we can't have one without the other. They are so connected. Our love for God and our love for one another are connected. If it's going to be complete, those two things have to be working together. And this is what Jesus wants to remind us of in this prayer. And then he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's just simply saying, God, I know I tend to screw up. Please help me to stay on the right path. Oh, God, help me to keep my attention on you, to hear your voice, to walk with you, to listen to you, to follow you, so that I don't go off the path. Please, God, help me. It's a very simple prayer, and it's also a very humbling prayer, right? It's admitting, yes, I do screw up. There is a log in my eye, right? I need to deal with that first. And then again, he repeats this idea in verse 14, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And that actually, that verse bothered me for the longest time. Jesus, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And here's, if I can just summarize it, here's what I, I think is a, is a simple way for us to maybe understand what's going on there. See, <clears throat> unforgiveness... If I have unforgiveness in my heart, that is a sin. And if I have not repented of my unforgiveness towards someone else, I'm not letting go of it. I haven't confessed it. I haven't repented of it, and so it remains. And until I forgive and I let go of this unforgiveness in me, how can I be forgiven of it? Because I'm holding on to it so tightly. Again, these things are connected. 
the way I receive love from God, the way I love others, the way I receive mercy, and the way I give mercy. All of these things are intended to be working hand in hand. Now, I've got to say, that's great. And you probably have heard all of that before. Um, and maybe you're going to hear, you've already heard before what I'm about to say. But, um, but I hadn't. It was a, a few, probably maybe about a year or so ago, I was looking at this scripture and looking at this passage. And it just something clicked that I had never noticed before. And maybe it was because I was trying to see it with new eyes, not to listen to it or read it or repeat it as some automatic pilot thing that I just keep repeating it because I've heard it a million times, but to really, really think about it. What is Jesus trying to say here? What is it that maybe I'm missing? I'm missing the message because I'm, I'm not paying attention to it. I think I already know it. It's really hard to teach people something if they think they already know it. Have you noticed that? So we have to come at it fresh with a place of thing. Maybe just saying possibly, maybe I don't see it. Maybe there's something I'm not noticing. Well, I'm going to tell you what I noticed, and this blew my mind. It's very simply this, that the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer, is not about me. It's not about me. Here's your first clue. Jesus doesn't tell us to pray, my Father who is in heaven. Give me my daily bread. God, forgive me my trespasses. God, deliver me from evil. It doesn't say that. Now, I'll be honest, every single time I have ever come to this passage, and even when I've repeated it, and when I think about it, I always think of it as if this is a prayer about me. But it isn't. What is it saying? It's right in front of us. Jesus tells us to pray like this, our Father. He's not just my Father, right? He's our Father. I'm part of a family of God that includes every human being on this planet. I am connected to you, and you are connected to me, and we are connected to God. He's our Father. And he continues. He tells us to, to pray this. God, give us today our daily bread. It's not just about me getting my daily bread. Jesus wants us when we come and we pray and we close the door and we get in the closet, it's just us and God, to talk to God about my neighbors. God, do they have enough food? Do they have daily bread? God, give us, all of us today, our daily bread. And you know what? If Jesus has given me a little extra, and I know that my neighbor across the street or someone in my, in my life doesn't have enough, I think maybe what he wants us to do is to share the extra we have so that everybody has enough. Again, Jesus is trying to reframe our perspective that it isn't just about you. It's not just about me. We are connected to one another. So he tells us to pray this way, our Father. Give us today our daily bread. Oh, Father God, forgive us, not just me. <laughs> I want forgiveness for you too. Forgive all of us. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven each other. Like we're all, we're all in this together, right? And lead us not into temptation. God, help all of us to stay on the right path. Help all of us to stay focused on you. Again, it's asking me to not just look at myself, to not be this person who is so withdrawn that I only care about me and myself and even my own family, but I expand that circle outward and outward and outward and outward. And this radically changed the way I read and understood what Jesus is wanting us to to how he wants us to pray. Because again, he wants us to recognize that God is our Father. And I, I want to say this, maybe this is controversial, but it's taken me a while to kind of get to this place. Because I think for the longest time I would think of it like this, like, well, when we say our Father, well, we mean Christians. But really, I mean, there's so many verses. In fact, one of the most famous ones is in the book of Acts, where Paul, Paul is in Athens, and he's surrounded by idol-worshiping pagans. And they even have a, 
They even have an idol to the unknown God. And Paul kind of gets inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he stands up and he addresses the Athenians, these idol-worshiping pagans, and he says, let me tell you about this unknown God that you don't know. And what he tells them is, you know, he says that you are his offspring, and we are all his children. And in fact, this God is the one in whom we all live and move and have our being. Wow. <laughs> so he really is our Father. We are all created in the image of God. We are all His children. And so when I pray, Our Father, I'm not even putting my, trying to put my arms around the Christian church. I'm trying to put my arms around the world. I'm trying to open my heart to the idea that every human being I will ever meet, I will ever see, I will ever have a conversation with, regardless of what country they're from, what religion they have, their orientation, or anything else, their race, their creed, their color, anything. What I'm looking into is the face of someone loved by God, made in the image of God, and someone who is my brother or sister, like it or not. He is our Father, and we are one family. And this is a radical thing. This has really helped me and really allowed me to, again, just expand my understanding of who God is and who I am. And so, I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor. You don't have to stand. <laughs> But I would like us to try to, let's, let's repeat this prayer together. Again, not to be seen by men, <laughs> because, because we want to show off. Um, not because we think that if we repeat this prayer together, somehow God will hear us. No, we know God sees us. We have confidence that God hears us. But let's try to pray this prayer with this brand new perspective and understanding that we've just looked at. This idea of our connectedness to God, our connectedness to one another, this community that we are a part of. And let's repeat this together. Do we have it up? I don't know if we have it up on the screen or not. There we go. Let's say this together. You'll notice, by the way, I'm going to emphasize certain things. Unless you don't have to, but I, hopefully it'll help you. Let's try it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah. Praise God from whom all blessings.